that means that if we get two weeks of uh, continuous freezing, there is no reason why, at least for uh, meteorological reasons, the Russians should not launch their coming offensive. So I think that's the first thing. Secondly, Bakhmut has figured prominently in everybody's uh, calculus because it's drawn so much attention. Bakhmut has turned into something that is analogous in some ways to Hitler's obsession with Stalingrad for Zelensky. Zelensky and his friends seem to think that uh, the loss of Bakhmut is unacceptable, would break the will of uh, you know, the Ukrainian people, demoralize Ukrainian forces. And so he's continued to sacrifice thousands of Ukrainian lives in that place. Uh, we now estimate 450,000 casualties thus far in the war, close to 150,000 dead. Ooh. And uh, uh, this is both sides, 450 and 150. No, no, this is the Ukrainian side. Oh, and if you listen to uh, General Saluzhny, he came on earlier today or it could have been last night, talked about how supposedly the Russians are advancing over the bodies of their dead comrades because the Ukrainians have killed so many. The only thing I can think of is that he's channeling Baghdad Bob. If you remember when we intervened in Iraq in 2003, you had this Baghdad Bob kept coming on telling everybody about the victorious forces right. of Saddam Hussein throwing us back, inflicting casualties. I, I remember Baghdad uh, Bob. But I tried to interview him, but he he turned it down. <laughs> turned down everybody from Fox, understandably. Uh, but I'm interested in your comparison of General uh, Jaluzny to Baghdad Bob of all people. I thought. General uh, Jaluzny was the adult and was uh, credible not only to the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian public, but to the Russian high command. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about the last part of uh, you're credible to the Russians. I just don't know what they think. Uh, I, I doubt seriously that they hold anybody in the current regime in high esteem. Having said that, remember that Zaluzny was actually very honest to the extent that he could be in his uh, economist interview and essentially pointed out, I need a new army. I need all of this equipment. If I don't get it, I'm probably not going to be able to withstand what's coming from the Russians. But now he's back in the saddle and he's been told to get back online and back on board. And the mantra is we're killing Russians, uh, you know, by the hundreds every day we're winning, we're doing well, but you know, as well as I do, they're now pressing teenagers into service. We have photos of them and, and video coming out over various uh, internet sites, which is tragic to say the least. 16-year-old well, it's, boys. It's, it's not only tragic, and as you pointed out to me in some private emailing you uh, and I did, you know, where are the NGOs? Where are the non-government organizations that are humanitarian uh, to to prevent this? And it's probably, I don't know how old these kids were. The kids that I saw, their faces looked 14, 15, 16. It was hard to tell because they had military gear on, but they were, they didn't shave yet. Let's, let's put it that oh, way. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be a, a violation of international law and clearly European uh, human rights, which is pretty sensitive on the use of children uh, in the military. But, but beyond that, is it not telling of how desperate uh, Zelensky is? Well, if course. he's conscripting 15 and 16 year olds, of course. But to this, you've also got to add the fact that they are desperately tr seeking foreign fighters. Now, uh, the foreign fighters are becoming very, very important to them because they just don't have experienced NCOs and officers anymore. They're bringing in raw talent with very little training. And of course, you have this man, Milburn, the retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel who came out and gave an interview and talked about how desperate the Ukrainians were. And he talked about the heavy losses and, and frankly, why he, he was pulling out his mercenary training group. So I think, uh, <clears throat> I think at this point in time, it's really up to the Russians. The initiative is passed to them. The weather is in their favor now, and there's nothing to stop them from attacking whenever they want to by the middle of January. What is the status of the 300,000 or so, more or less, uh, reservists called up to duty back in the fall, trained, armed, transported, ready to go. I I'm assuming trained, armed, and tra transported, and ready to go. Leave that to you to correct me. 
No, I, I think so. Understand that I do disagree a little bit with some other analysts. Uh, Scott Ritter has, has argued it's going to take longer to get them ready. I, I think they're integrated now. As I said, they, they're getting the two weeks of freezing temperatures. Okay. There is no reason why they cannot attack. And everything that's been happening down in the Donbass, everything that happens with these missile strikes that go in day after day, is all about shaping the battle space, making it safe, if you will, for the maximum offensive power of the Russian army. All right. In in the interest of fairness, and because yeah. this is television, and because I like, or, or it's, it's streaming, because I like to stir the pot, you know, we from time to time have sure. others on than you and uh, Scott Ritter, even though you what? and Scott are what? our- You have other people on? I'm shocked, Judge. Are, are our favorites. Uh, this is a person, a longtime friend of mine, longtime uh, CIA guy that our audience loves to hate. And I asked him, Jack Devine, uh, about the 300,000 Russians. It's a long answer, but he gets around to answering it at the end. Gary? Doesn't he have about 300,000 called up, uniformed, now trained reservists about to enter the theater of war? And if he does, wouldn't that overwhelm the Ukrainian forces? He had 180,000 in the last round. I mean, that's not chicken feed, right? And you looked at it. They weren't armed properly. Where did they get the new arms? Where did they get the training? How did they get so battle ready in six months? You're looking at Ukrainians have been fighting for almost a year now. They're as tough as nails. Their strategy, their planning. You're going to send a lot of rookies in. Do they have gas? Do they have logistics? 300,000. They're going to just march in. They're going to use air power. I mean, do they want to fight? We know what wars are like when people, they went into Afghanistan. My goodness. I mean, a full-blown Russian army went in and was driven off by sheep herders. And why? Because the, and I'll tell you firsthand, the Russian soldiers did not want to fight in Afghanistan. Are they really going to fight in Ukraine? I mean, it's like, you're almost like a civil war and it's unprovoked. I, well, we'll see how, look at the Iraqi army. How many troops are in the Iraqi army, Judge? 300,000 armed by the United States. Where did they go? <laughs> They went home. So size isn't the story. All right, Colonel. I saw you chuckling on the monitor. What do you think? <clears throat> well, I Jack don't... is always going to mouth the party line. I don't know. Maybe sure. they they this would be against the law. Maybe they clip the pensions of CIA officers who've retired and failed to mouth the company line. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't see this man as someone who knows much about Russians or Ukrainians. His comments about Afghanistan are, are really very misleading. The, the Russian, if we go back and look at the Soviet forces that went into Afghanistan at the beginning, they were overwhelmingly Russians. They went in there and they very rapidly established themselves. Then the subsequent follow-on forces were overwhelmingly reservists that came out of Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, in other words, nearby places. And frankly, these people weren't terribly interested in, in fighting what was there. But having said all of that, uh, our so-called Iraqi army vanished almost overnight, whereas the Soviet trained forces held forth for a couple of years. After after they left, and so did does, its government. Does he have a point when he says the three hundred thousand don't have the will to fight, or no. are these three hundred thousand? I mean, what are we talking about? Are we talking about like National Guard guys who have jobs during the week and they train one week and a month and two <laughs> two weeks a summer like here, or are we talking about hardened? professionals. Well, first of all, unlike most of your National Guardsmen in the United States, all of these 300,000 have served inside the Russian army. Ah, they That's have been important. on active duty. Yeah. And anywhere from three to eight years. And so what they've been going through is uh, essentially updating their training, updating them on the various modernization programs, the equipment that's available. And they've been training for winter fighting. Uh, and they've been training very, very hard. The other thing is, I don't think this man really understands anything about Russians or Ukrainians. First of all, we all know Ukrainians are tough. Uh, I grew up with them, and uh, I know their war record. They've always been very, very fine soldiers. That's not open to debate. 
But it doesn't matter how good you are when you're up against overwhelming firepower and you take enormous losses, which is what's happened. On the Russian side, anybody who thinks the Russians are weak are, are, is crazy. In fact, I would say these 300,000 are not only enthusiastic about going to Ukraine, I think they have enormous backing at home inside Russia. Uh, all the words on the atrocities committed by Ukrainian forces against Russian troops have filtered out to the population, despite the fact that, that the Putin government has tried to clamp down on it and suppress it, largely because they're afraid of what this anger could produce in Russia against Ukraine. In, so in, I, I totally disagree with his entire assessment. Okay. In the midst of all of this, um, President Emmanuel Macron uh, of France has weighed in. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what he said. I think it was on New Year's Eve. France will continue to help Ukraine, quote, without fail, and quote, until victory itself. We will build a just and durable peace together. Count on France and count on Europe. Is he talking about troops? What is he talking about, as you understand this? Or is this just political <laughs> pabulum uh, for, for the French press? Uh, I think it's uh, a combination of all the above. He's also made uh, comments about finding a way forward that's not going to involve compelling Russia to give up all of its gains. He said He's already said publicly, we can't expect the Russians to give up uh, Crimea. And he said, we should have pressed ahead in the Minsk agreements and done a better job with Luhansk and Donetsk and so forth. I think it depends on which audience he's talking to and when you hear him. All right. Here's um, General Stoltenberg, uh, the commander uh, of NATO. I call on allies to do more. It is in all our security interests to make sure Ukraine prevails and Russian President Vladimir Putin, he mentions him by name, does not win. This is pretty direct and in your face, uh, Secretary General of NATO to President of Russia, isn't it, Colonel? Well, let's stop and think about what he's just said. How many times did you hear FDR or any of the leading lights uh, in the U.S. military or the government during World War II complain about the failure of the British or the Soviets to do enough? This is a trick question. Yeah. Never. All right? right. That's nonsense. We never made those kinds of comments because they were in the fight long before we were and they were heavily engaged. We were giving them everything we could to keep them engaged until we could bring force to bear against them. My point is, if this were a successful operation, a successful war effort, you wouldn't be begging your allies to do more. The truth of the matter is that Europeans overwhelmingly want nothing to do with this war and their governments know it. Is there military significance to what uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg said? Does he command troops? Can he order troops in? Stoltenberg is a mouthpiece for whomever governs Washington, for whomever is president of the United States, whatever the administration is. He says and does what Washington tells him to. And he can snap his fingers, he can crack his whip, but you can't create armies and forces out of nothing. It takes a long time to put people into organizations, into formations, train them, equip them. This is not something you do quickly. Frankly speaking, that's why we've been waiting for several months now, watching the Ukrainians impale themselves on Russian defenses, because the Russians are doing exactly that. They're getting ready all of these massive military formations to attack. So what if we start going down the list and the, the French army is designed to conduct safaris in North Africa. The British army is smaller and less capable. You know, the United States Marine Corps is larger and better equipped and, and better organized to fight than most of the European forces. The Poles are now bringing up, we think, 200,000 men. I'm told they've already got 90,000 mobilized, and they're trying to get them ready so that they can build their army up, presumably to defend Poland, but I worry about other things as we well, know. General, I am very concerned about Poland. You, you and I have discussed this. You know this better than almost anybody. There's 90,000 Poles on active duty. There's 40,000 Americans intermingling and training with them. They are just east, excuse me, they are just west of the Pole, Poland-Ukraine border. Now you tell me that this crazy president of Poland who thinks that somehow Crimea is going to go back to Ukraine when this is over, is about to add 250,000 more troops. 
Oh, absolutely. That's where the hair trigger could occur, in my view, that would start World War III. What do you think? Well, here's the other thing. They're, the Poles see themselves as a great nation that has been deprived of its opportunity to be great. They're, they were great 400 years ago. They were powerful in, in Europe, the largest state in Europe, the most powerful military force in Europe 400, 500 years ago. They would really like to be that again. And so when you you're, listen carefully to the polls and you watch their television, they're talking about expanding Poland to regain control of territories they once governed. Mm. That's not necessarily a NATO objective. And I don't think that the majority of NATO partners are going to stand by and say, oh, yes, charge forward. Let's support the annexation of Western Ukraine. And by the way, Minsk used to be part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Oh, that, that would be insane. That. that would be insane. Of course. Yeah. So the Poles, are, the Poles are not playing with a full deck in, in really in strategic terms right now. All and right. we're we doing nothing to rein them in. On the contrary, we're encouraging them. Recently, um, uh, the Ukrainians, using either missiles or drones, uh, attacked a building where uh, Russian troops were housed. Adjacent to the building, I think stupidly and foolishly, but I'm not the military guy. I'm just a simple lawyer. <laughs> Adjacent to the building where the Russians had stored munitions. Uh, it appears that the munitions exploded. Uh, close to 100 Russians were killed, and now it appears that the uh, Ukrainian missiles, American missiles, were able to zero in somehow because they knew that Russian troops were there because they were using their cell phones. Can you explain this? Six HIMARS missiles were fired, or, or rockets, if you will, were fired at, at this target. It was a company-sized element, almost 200 men. Hmm. Four of those... Uh, Missiles or rockets were shot down. Two went in and blasted the area and caused at least 89 deaths, as the Russians are now reporting them, another 100 casualties. The Ukrainians, of course, are this is a piece of good news for a change. They inflicted some serious losses on the Russians. They're very happy. In the grand scheme of things, it's irrelevant. But the truth is, and we're told that this was a mobile phone, or at least two mobile phones, but the truth is that if you know where the cell phone towers are and people use their mobile phones, simple triangulation will provide you with a target. What was and, this and target? You need to keep in mind is that, remember, we're providing the intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, the overhead right. capability, the communications. I'm sure we had a role in this because once you find that target, you've got to strike it immediately. And was, they this, was this target in Russia or was no. it in Ukraine? It was in Ukraine. But the, the thing is this, that could happen to us. could happen to the United States Army. Uh, the, the Russians have actually done this pretty well to, to date. It's a mistake. It's an accident. It shouldn't have happened. And these people would probably be alive. But this is something we should watch carefully because we'll fight in the future. And we have an enormous problem with very talkative soldiers on radios. <clears throat> I think it's very clear that our ammunition stocks as well as... Uh, Key items of equipment, uh, such as your self-propelled 155 millimeter gun, are in very short supply now as a result of having to supply the Ukrainians. You ask, is it dangerously low? It's only dangerous if we are contemplating a confrontation with the Russians. Uh, you know, that that is out of the question in my view. And for that matter, if we were to go back to the Middle East and take on any number of opponents there, it would be equally ill-advised. So I would say it's not dangerous unless we are stupid and decide to intervene somewhere. Have we um, supplied the uh, Ukrainian military from our surplus or from our substance? Both. But we have had to rely increasingly on the substantive American military capabilities. There's now talk about sending even more sophisticated missiles with greater ranges, uh, which I find disturbing because the more we do this, the more likely we are to end up in a confrontation with the Russians for which we're completely unprepared. But there's talk about that right now in the media. The last time uh, we spoke, which was a day or two before Thanksgiving, 
Uh, we talked about uh, whether or not there was any impetus on the part of the State Department or NATO uh, diplomats to push uh, President Zelensky and President Putin, to the extent they can push Putin anywhere, toward the negotiating table. In the interim, you sent me some videos which are too horrific for us to show, which show uh, Ukraine atrocities against captured Russian soldiers. So these are captured Russian soldiers who ought to have been protected by the Geneva Conventions. Obviously, they weren't. They were executed uh, with bullets in the head. Why would this have happened? Why would there have been videos of it? Why would the videos of it have been displayed uh, on uh, Ukraine streaming sites? Well, Judge, you're right. <clears throat> the video uh, videos that show Russian prisoners of war being essentially murdered after they've surrendered have been posted by Ukrainian soldiers. These are videos taken by Ukrainian soldiers and then posted on the internet, uh, essentially as a point of pride. Uh, mm. in Belief that they are somehow another frightening or horrifying the Russians, who knows. But I also think there's another sinister dimension to this. I think there's an interest in Ukraine, particularly in Kiev or Kiev, to ensure that there can be no negotiated settlement between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Not, not so much because of uh, people in Kiev that might be willing to talk, but I think there's growing fear that Washington will ultimately abandon them. They know that uh, Ukraine fatigue is not exclusive to Europe. Ukraine fatigue is certainly having an impact inside the United States. They can read the news. They know that the new Republican Congress may well turn out to be much less willing to support them than the previous one. So under the circumstances, I think they want to make it almost impossible. And one way you do that is by murdering your opponent's soldiers and then posting videos about it because it so poisons the waters, if you will, with Russia. And it makes it so difficult for the Russians, particularly President Putin, to come to any arrangement because the Russian people are seeing these things and are incensed. You have Russian military commanders. And, and frankly, you know, from the beginning, we've accused the Russians of terrible things. They did not do those things. They did not mass rape. They did not mass murder. That's all nonsense. It's all propaganda that the Ukrainians cooked up and then was, was disseminated across the West and eagerly regurgitated by the Western media, but it was never well, true. Well, I'm assuming that what you sent me was real. It certainly oh, looked it real. It's on absolutely, absolutely real. There was another video in the mix, though, that was kind of entertaining because it showed what appeared to be an attempt by the Ukrainians to orchestrate uh, a, a fake Russian attack on civilians. I mean, it, it, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess for us, uh, they showed the director of the operation, lights, cameras, and, and supporting people. <laughs> it was and this has been done before by the Ukrainians as well. All right. Would, would the um, mass display of Ukraine war crimes and atrocities on captured defenseless Russian soldiers boys, uh, have been approved by the high command, or is this some rogue uh, endeavor by the more hardcore of the Ukraine troops? Do you have an answer to that or an idea if there, on that? If, there, if this was a, a one-off uh, and then suddenly the Ukrainian government uh, directed that these videos be removed and then uh, made a statement that uh, they're going to look into this to establish the facts, and if this is in fact true, they will take action. If that had happened, then one would conclude that these were rogue elements, but that has not happened. And so the, the only conclusion I can reach is that people in Kiev are saying, look, uh, this will keep the war going. This will make it harder for the United States to abandon us because the Russians won't do business. And that's what they currently think is in their interest. Um, I want to put uh, on the screen a map of Ukraine, which you have seen. In fact, you were gracious enough to uh, send it to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let our viewers take a moment or so to look at it. The, the red starbursts represent areas where there's been the concentration of Russian, military, of Russian missiles and uh, artillery. 
uh, the blue represent areas of blackouts where there's no uh, electricity or water uh, to speak of. In the sort of lower right of this portion of Ukraine, the striped area represents the area that has been under Russians con Russia's control for a while. So let me start going all the way uh, west. Uh, are you surprised that uh, uh, the Russians sent their missiles all the way west? Well, what is the next country over there west? Forgive, forgive my ignorance. Well, west to, from the, the map that you're looking at right now where you see Lvov, just yeah. west of that 20 miles is the Polish border. Wow. Is it reckless for them to, for the Russians to send their missiles so close to the uh, Polish border? Is that a lesson to NATO? No, no, I, I, that's, it's not reckless at all. First of all, to understand what's happening now, this is very similar to what the United States did in Iraq, uh, to what it did to the Serbs during the, the Balkan campaigns, the Kosovo air campaign, very similar to what we did during World War II to Germany and Japan. We systematically identified the networks, the infrastructure for fuel, fuel storage, fuel distribution, and today power plants on a grand scale. We did that. We destroyed those places and essentially put countries in the dark and did exactly what you're describing, made it impossible for them to effectively lead normal lives. That was part of the plan. It worked very effectively in Germany. I mean, we, we were so effective against the fuel refining storage and distribution that it brought the Air Force and the, the Army almost to a standstill in Germany in 1945, certainly by the end of 44. Uh, so that's what that's what we're doing now. And this is long overdue. And this is part of the larger plan to prepare Ukraine for the coming offenses. I mean, why would you why would you let your opponent lead a comfortable, leisurely existence if you plan to attack him on a grand scale on the ground? Right. And see, before when this first phase, no one ever completely grasped what Moscow wanted. They wanted a, an arrangement. They wanted a negotiated settlement. They were not interested in destroying the country. They didn't want to kill large numbers of people. By the middle of the summer, it was clear that's not going to work. So they threw those assumptions out. They went on to essentially a strategic defense, an economy of force mission. Let's use as few forces as possible to hold on to what's ours, and then we'll build up for the offensive. And that's what's been going on. Now it's getting cold finally. So perhaps in three, four, five weeks or something, we'll see a major offensive. Gary, can you put the map up again? Colonel, I want to ask you about the sort of lower right-hand portion, if you will, right. where you see the gray and black stripes. Now, as I understand uh, uh, the um, symbols on the map, that reflects the portions of Ukraine, which are uh, in, in which Russian speaking people live and which the yes. Russian government controls. Yes. If I'm correct, don't I also see some red uh, symbols there showing Putin attacking that area with either missiles or, or artillery? How unusual is that? There are Russians living there. Well, let's not let's not say Putin attacking. You know, he's in Moscow. And okay. these strikes are ordered by the co high command of the Russian theater and General Sorovikin. Okay, Strike so the, the, the generals in chief are attacking yeah. where Russians live. Am I right? Well, first of all, understand something. That today we have this, this capability we call strike. Strike is different from what we imagine the standard use for artillery or rockets or missiles might be in the West. The only thing that separates one strike from another is time and space. And we have precision, which means that we could literally, if we saw something in your backyard where you live, Judge, and we thought it was threatening to us, we could target it and destroy everything in your backyard without necessarily harming you. Now, we demonstrated that capability during the Kosovo air campaign. Some of your viewers will remember that the Albanians in particular were shocked at our ability to attack Serb forces that stood next to or were positioned very close to Albanian homes, but they never damaged any Albanian homes. Well, the Russians can do the same thing. And so there was a decision to attack there, ostensibly because there was some connectivity to this power generation network, and they All decided right. to remove it. Now, beyond that, I don't know the details, but it's eminently capable. they're eminently capable of doing this with great precision. That's why 
striking those uh, targets that were near the border with Poland was not reckless because they know they can hit them with absolute precision. Okay, Gary, put the map up again, uh, please. So, Colonel, if the Russians can move with that much precision, then their uh, strikes around Lviv and Kiev, which we know destroyed residential areas, were done intentionally, that the destruction of homes and apartment buildings was not a byproduct. It was the goal. Is that fair no, to say? No, again, that's, that's, not, that's not accurate because the power stations and the power distribution networks were inside those areas. In other Where words, they the- decide we just want to level Keith. I mean, if they wanted to level Keith, they could do it tomorrow morning. It would take a couple of hours. So Where not- on the map uh, is the uh, nuclear power plant or nuclear power plants? Well, the, the nuclear power plant of greatest interest, of course, is the one to the south uh, in the vicinity of Zaporozhye, which the Russians are protecting. The Ukrainians have repeatedly tried to launch missiles and rockets and artillery rounds against that power station in the hopes of precipitating a nuclear crisis that they think they would benefit from. All right. Right above Zaporozhye, it shows the symbol for an explosion. Then to the left of Zaporozhye is the blue symbol for a blackout. And to the right of Zaporozhye, is the blue symbol for the blackout. So you're telling us that they want to isolate without destroying and prevent the use of the nuclear power plant in Zaporozhye. Yeah, well, they, it's not a question so much of preventing Ukrainians from using it. They, they are protecting that plant from Ukrainian attacks. Now, what they have done is that they have removed the connectivity, as you point out, uh, involving the transmission of power from these plants to Ukraine. That has been done, and that will continue to be done. And we ought to pause for a minute and understand the cascading effects of these attacks. This right. affects everything, every part of life in Ukraine. You're not just talking about transportation and, and water, of course. You're also talking about rural life where you have herds of cattle, herds of sheep, vast farmlands. Now those, thing, those, those animals and the farmland is lying fallow. The animals are dying. They're losing 20, 30 percent of their livestock, not because the Russians are killing them, but because they can't feed them. They can't move them. They can't sell them. They can't care for them. So the cascading effects are destroying completely the Ukrainian economy. So Ukraine right. output is about non-existent now. So uh, December 1st is three days from now. There's already snow on the ground in uh, the northern parts uh, of Ukraine. Where do you see this going in the next four or five, six weeks, say, between now and the first of the year? Well, the Ukraine, the experts on these matters, and I'm not one of them that knows something about the weather and about the terrain in Ukraine. I've seen some of Ukraine, but not all of it. And the Ukrainian black earth topsoil varies from four to 12 to 15 feet deep. It depends on where you are. That's why it's such a productive region. You have to freeze that because if it's not thoroughly frozen, you sink like a rock, whether you're in a truck or you're in a tank, it doesn't make any difference. It's not frozen yet. It's only just now dropped below freezing on a permanent basis. Up, up till this point, we've had freezing at night But during the daytime, it's gone back up into the 40s or even 50 degrees. It has to drop below freezing and stay that way for at least two weeks. So if it's now below freezing and it stays that way, you can do the math. You're looking for something happening no earlier than the 10th, probably no later than the 19th of December. And you're talking about concentrations of Russian troops all the way around the country. We've accounted now formally by look, these are the people that sit in front of your, in front of your monitors that, that control satellites. And uh, the intelligence community says that it's accounted for 540,000 Russian troops. Okay. Mm. And of that 540,000, we're talking about 5,000 armored fighting vehicles of which at least 1,500 are tanks, probably another thousand uh, self-propelled artillery the rest uh, infantry fighting vehicles, a thousand rockets, missiles, tactical ballistic missiles, your your so-called drones, unmanned attack systems, 
a thousand of those systems. That doesn't even begin to address the hundreds of fixed wing aircraft, hundreds of helicopters. The helicopters will move troops, obviously. There will be some ground support, hundreds of, of fixed wing aircraft operating as close air support and also bombers now. We've begun to see the use of bombers, which is something we've done for years. They're now beginning to do it, and they all have precision munitions. Okay, which so what you aim at. What you've just described must be understood and known by President Zelensky, by Ukrainian intelligence, by American intelligence, by the State Department, by the Pentagon, and by the White House. Yes. And what are they going to do about it? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to ship more equipment to the Ukrainians. The problem is the Ukrainian casualties have been horrendous, particularly over the last few months. There was an article today in the in the Euro News, uh, I'm told there's another one in the New York Times describing the very, very heavy casualties. Of course, the big lie that is always told to accompany the bad news is, well, the Russians have taken heavy casualties too. Nonsense. The Russians have not. And uh, that's the difference. When you're, you're killing your enemy at a 10 to 1 ratio, which is about where it is right now in southern Ukraine with the Russians and Ukrainians, you're not hurting at all. And the Russians, again, aren't running out of anything. The Ukrainians are running out of everything ammunition, spare parts, fuel, you name it. Their soldiers, most of the best troops are dead or wounded. And the people that they're shoving forward in, in the defensive positions are untrained reservists. They say, well, we sent 10,000 more troops to England for three weeks. Judge, you're not going to be able to train a man in three weeks to do much of anything or even five weeks. You need time. And time is something the Ukrainians no longer have. So the, right, whole, you are back. The, whole thing is, the whole thing is on the verge of collapse. Let's pretend you are back in the Pentagon as you were for a portion of the Trump administration. <clears throat> and uh, Secretary Austin, along with Secretary Lincoln, knock on your door. <clears throat> Colonel, what, what's your advice? What would you tell them? Get the well, hell out? I would show them the map and show them the identified concentrations of Russian forces along with a list of the capabilities, which are impressive in terms of firepower and maneuver. And I would also then bring up a, a, a truthful picture of Ukrainian fighting capabilities right now, which are very, very modest. And I would argue, given the terrible conditions that the population faces in Ukraine, it's no surprise that the Ukrainian government is saying leave. Even Klitschko, who is the mayor of Kiev, has told the population, you really should leave. We're not going to have any power. We won't have water and fuel to heat. Uh, you're going to have to go somewhere else and seek shelter. This is the capital city. And millions of these Ukrainians are going to pack it in, and they're going to head west. So you're going to have another gigantic mass casualty event, if you will, on Europe's doorstep with millions of refugees pouring into Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. And obviously, in many, in many cases, these frontline states will simply herd them further West into other countries because they can't take anymore. Back to my hypothetical. Back to my my hypothetical door knocking. What can the American government say to President Zelensky to get him to the negotiating table? You're not getting anything else from us. Uh, first of all, Zelensky will do what you tell him. So, if you tell Zelensky that the game is up, it's time to come to terms with reality. This is, this is an injustice, a monstrous injustice to the Ukrainian people to fight on at this point. We'll have to accept the fact that a negotiation is necessary. We're going to have to accept that concessions will be made, including territorial concessions. And if you do that, the Ukrainians will go along with it. They won't like it, but they'll go along with it. Now, there is a theory that Zelensky, if he goes along with something like this, will be killed by the radical nationalists. Well, I suppose that's possible. I can't prove that. I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is that you should draw the, the obvious conclusions. You know, your position is untenable. It's effectively hopeless. And, you, you know, you need to end this thing before matters get much, much worse. But there's no willing to do, willingness to do that because the, the pain, even though we're suffering <clears throat> economically from some of the after effects of our sanctions that have done more damage to us and our allies, than to Russia, 
the damage to us is modest. The people who are really suffering, though, are the Europeans. Their economies are in serious trouble right now. As anybody who wants to turn on a business channel, they'll all tell you about it. And it's not just energy. Again, cascading effects. There are huge problems across the economic production spectrum, if you will. So <clears throat> it makes sense to end this and accept the fact that you lost. You know, you bet that you could bully Russia. Well, my impression is, based upon the reports I've received from friends on the inside, is that we turned the transponders off that are normally attached to the unmanned uh, vehicle. As a result, uh, we were trying to move in close within the air defense identification zone that belongs to the Russians. Everybody has these. When you move into that ADIZ, you're supposed to acknowledge that you're there, identify yourself. Obviously, we didn't want to do that. So without the transponders, uh, it was trying to be stealthy and uh, gather intelligence on the Crimean installations, installations on Crimea that belong to the Russian military. It didn't work out. And the Russians uh, were within their international, within the legal bounds of international law to take it out, which they did. Whether or not they actually did it in the way that's described, I don't know. That sounded suspicious. I haven't heard of planes colliding with other planes to take them down. Have you heard of uh, planes emptying their fuel on drones, almost as if to uh, mimic a dog urinating? No, I, I haven't, uh, haven't heard that either. I mean, quite frankly, I don't know how it happened, but I do know that the Russians disposed of it and it crashed into the sea. And I know why it was there. It was there to collect intelligence, targeting data for installations in Crimea. Oh they, my. Also, they also this, use it, I'm told, to target the bridge that uh, we tried to destroy. Is this any different from a, a Chinese balloon? Well, it is different in the sense that this is inside the air defense identification zone of Russia. And yes, you're right. The Chinese balloon was inside our air, de air defense identification zone. And we were within our legal rights to shoot it down. So absolutely, that's true. But I think uh, this is not the first time that this has happened. I think the Russians have simply sent a message. We're, we're, we're not going to tolerate it anymore. How um, effective... You know, I, I just estimated 10,000 feet. I mean, do you know how high it was and how effective these drones are uh, at uh, gathering data about uh, Russian military activities in Crimea? Well, I think they're very effective in terms of collecting data. Uh, whether they're more effective at 10,000 than they are at 5,000 or it makes no difference, I don't know. But I do know that all these unmanned collectors, whether it's Global Hawk or the the one that we're talking about, are all excellent and do a, a great job. Um, I, I heard a statement from uh, President Putin uh, the other day. I mean, I heard it translated uh, into English uh, about uh, the relationship between the United States and Germany. I think you know where I'm going. President Putin said, Germany is still occupied. He didn't finish the sentence, but I think he obviously meant occupied as it was by the Allied forces after World War II, uh, an historic event with which we're all generally familiar. He was basically mocking uh, the German government for putting up with the American government, telling it to sit down, be quiet, be a good boy, while we destroy your pipeline with Russia. Yes, I wouldn't quite term the uh, condition of our influence in Germany as a equal to a occupation that's that's over the top but clearly uh mr schultz has behaved as though he were a vassal of the greater american empire today i received an email about a firm in germany that uh, is involved with metal work uh they 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 make alloys they build alloys and they also bend metal and so forth this firm has been in business since 1380 Ooh. as a result as a result of the loss of cheap energy, in other words, energy they can afford, which was the natural gas that came out of Russia, this firm, for the first time since 1380, is going out of business. And uh, thousands of people are going to suffer as a result of this. And this is completely unnecessary. This shouldn't have happened. But that's just one more piece of evidence for the stupidity and the folly of destroying the Nord Stream 2. Uh, we, that was a monumental mistake. 
it's an act of war by the United States against the Germans. I don't think Mr. Schultz and his friends are going to be in government too much longer. I can't predict when, but I think the German people are, are going to object to this, and they've had enough of it. Well, they're going to find that guy on the on the sailboat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like the minnow, the boat that got lost on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is absurd. Uh, well, actually, I think I think we have to give Gilligan more credit. Uh, he'd have done a better job, uh, at least, <laughs> of creating fiction. Now, this is this is utterly absurd, but this is the CIA. And, and you're making an important point. If you look at the recent articles that have come out in the New York Times and the Washington Post, just within the last 48 hours, we're now beginning to see the truth actually creep into articles about the Ukraine war. And what I'm talking about are the horrific casualties that the Ukrainians are taking, the devastating impact of, of Russian artillery and Russian rockets and missiles, the, the terrible conditions for, for life for the people in Ukraine. It's actually being mentioned now. So that's a good thing. You uh, recently wrote uh, that uh, well-regarded estimates show that between 150 and 200,000 Ukrainians have been killed in action. These are military people killed in action. And you saw another estimate that was as high as 250,000. Yes. How big is their army? How much longer could they tolerate a well, loss of 200,000 in, in 12 months? Well, this is this is another important question, and I think Ukraine has actually built three armies. They had one that we destroyed, or actually the Russians destroyed, uh, early in the war, I would say between February and July. A second army was configured, equipped, and sent into action after July, and that one was largely destroyed by Christmas. And then a third one was constructed. This is all based on waves of mobilization. Uh, inducting people forcibly and otherwise. It's gotten so bad with the manpower shortage in Ukraine that just yesterday I received reports from people in Odessa that told me they were watching as Ukrainian men of various ages from 16 up to 50 were being apprehended in cafes and restaurants in Odessa, mm. shoved into trucks and disappearing. Literally, no, no questions, no discussion. Get on the truck, gun in your face, you're going to the front. And we know from the reports we're getting from Ukrainian soldiers that post these things on the internet that the average life on the front for a new recruit is about, what, three or four hours because well, these people have no experience. They may get, if they're lucky, three or four weeks of training, some time on a rifle range. That's absurd. So they're getting more and more people killed needlessly. Colonel, even if they have three or four weeks of training, if they don't have ammunition in their weapons, the yeah. training is moot. They're just a body being sent out there to slaughter. Well, they, they are receiving uh, small arms ammunition, maybe not as much as they would like. And of course, if you're in a, in a combat zone, I can tell you from experience, you never have enough ammunition. You've right. got it piled up all around you. you did, the last thing in the world is you don't want to run out of it. The problem for the Ukrainians is They've run out of artillery ammunition. And so they're not giving artillery support to their soldiers. Now, you're talking about a war which the Russians already have a 10 to 1 advantage in firepower from artillery systems. Now their own artillery can't fire because they don't have any more 155 shells. When you look at the losses, they range in the thousands for howitzers, tanks, and other equipment. The Russians are killing these things as fast as they show up. And a lot of it is, is done in the following way. A, a small drone is flown over Ukrainian lines. They discover that there's a, an artillery system, an air defense system, a radar. Then come a different set of drones that literally fly right into those pieces of equipment and disable them. And then if that's not enough, rocket artillery rains down on what's there and kills everyone. So this is a sort of procedure that goes on again and again and again. Let's talk a big picture in, in a, a piece you recently uh, published with apologies to Winston Churchill <laughs> entitled The Gathering Storm. Great title, Colonel. Uh, you actually give a little bit of praise to Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who, whom you refer to as a rabid supporter of the proxy war. We all know that. But one who recognizes 
the President Zelensky's insistence that we uh, assist them to recapture the Crimea is A, absurd, and B, is a red line, uh, which would result in disastrous uh, consequences from President Putin. Right. Well, it's too bad he didn't reach that conclusion many months ago when right. we could have said that in January or December right. of last year and avoided that pointless discussion. The other thing is, I think William Butler Yates was the first to talk about the gathering storm. So I don't think okay. it's been originated that. But having said all <laughs> of that. Uh, you mean they they taught English courses at West Point? <laughs> well, I, I think we had couldn't resist. Good English I, love, I love Yates. I we did you. have some pretty good English instructors. I got to give them credit at West Point. Actually, the, the best one I had was at VMI, but that's a long story. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that people inside the administration, not just Secretary, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, are realizing this is an unwinnable war for the yes. Ukrainians. They know that. They, they know the true picture, the real losses. Remember that when Zelensky and his general Zeluzhny came over here, in private, they were very frank and open about the seriousness of the situation. They were afraid of an immediate Russian offensive. This is in January. That didn't happen, fortunately, because of the weather. That gave them a new lease of life through the spring. And so they hoped that they would get this massive influx of equipment. But we've reached the point now where even if they received laser pistols that everyone could use, they don't have people trained to use it. They don't have the trained manpower. The losses have been so bad, there's no combat experience. People like that just show up and die. And right. that's exactly what's happening in eastern Ukraine. So when President Zelensky says publicly and privately, I assume privately, uh, we want you to help us liberate um, Ukraine, uh, liberate um, Crimea, is he, is he dumb like a fox? Is he really asking for more than he expects to get so that what he does get will be enough to achieve realistic goals? Or does he really and truly believe that the West would help him invade Crimea no matter what the cost? And we can all only imagine what that cost would be. Uh, I think that he's been told several times over the last several years as this war approached. Remember, this is not a surprise. Right. Uh, the, the Ukrainian military was built expressly for this purpose of fighting Russia. We thought that the Ukrainians would have the initiative and attack the two so-called breakaway republics first. That didn't happen. Putin preempted them and went into the area. But I think they have been told this over and over and over again. Now, we know that's not possible, but it may be he's also being told to maintain this fiction to the bitter end. If you say anything other than what we have been saying for months, we won't support you anymore. That's a distinct possibility. He did uh, recently ask for cluster bombs. Now, cluster bombs have been defined as a war crime. I don't know how he knows we have them. I didn't know we have them. I don't know what we're doing with them. I'd, I'd be extremely dismayed if we gave them to him. Why would he ask for something like that? Well, I don't think he's concerned about damage to civilians because the Ukrainian artillery in Donetsk has been firing artillery rounds into, into urban areas populated by Russians in Donetsk and Luhansk now for months and months and months. Remember, they killed 14,000 people between the coup and the invasion of right. Ukraine by the Russians. That's one of the reasons they went in. They wanted to put a stop to this. And it's now stopping, not completely, but they're getting closer to it on the Russian side. So I, I don't think he's worried about that, but we under no circumstances should supply it. I can tell you from personal experience with these munitions, they have a, a big problem with the dud rate. You, if you have 10, 15, 20% of the bomblets that do not explode, then they end up in the hands of children who don't know what they're looking at. It looks like a right. baseball. Right. And then you have horrific injuries. And then beyond that, then your, your wheeled vehicles, if they drive over them, they'll be destroyed. Right. It's a dumb idea. I would get rid of it. Well, we all signed, or certainly the U.S. signed a, a treaty in 2004. There are unmistakably, indisputably uh, elements of war crimes and, and prohibited, but who knows if we really have them. Um, a good friend of mine interviewed a good friend of yours. <laughs> John Stewart interviewed Dave Petraeus. So here's uh, General Petraeus 
in fairness to him, at his ridiculous best. The security challenges that face us right now are more complex and actually greater than any that we have faced actually during the post-Cold War era. It's just hard to see the evidence of a learning curve manifest. It still feels like our foreign policy is everything, everywhere, all at once. Well, I, th I think the argument there is going to be that, look, if we don't do it, someone else will. If you think of us as the guy in the circus who puts a plate on the stick and gets it spinning, the biggest plate, I think bigger than all the others uh, together, is China. It's the U.S. relationship with China, the U.S. with our allies and partners. They help us keep some of these plates spinning. But then you have still North Korea with its nuclear program. Just but perhaps that. maybe the, but the issue there's is Russia, there's we're not going to solve. And maybe but it's, it's American okay. Just understanding. keep the plate spinning. So John Stewart is trying to make uh, the argument against the use of American military to advance American exceptionalism, an argument you have made, I have made, people that agree with us have made, people watching us now have made. What the hell is Petraeus talking about? Plates spinning. Do you know? Can you, can you guess? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, of the two comedians, <laughs> I thought that John Stewart was far more persuasive, obviously. Yes. Interesting. You know, we can't afford to be everywhere doing everything all the time. He could have added one more po point that no one wants to admit in Washington. We don't need to be everywhere doing everything all the time. See, Petraeus lives in this fantasy world where the world is full of threats. Everyone is a potential enemy. And there are only certain people who are friends and everyone else is an enemy. Therefore, there are lots of enemies. So we have to be everywhere and we can't succeed. He knows that. We can't win, but that's all right. You just stay there in perpetuity. In other words, it's like Afghanistan. You could stay in Afghanistan for 50 more years and have no impact whatsoever on the place. That's okay. The point is to stay for 50 years. <laughs> so what 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 military or what what American benefit is there to follow the advice that General Petraeus had offered? Oh none. 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 Why he says stuff like that, I guess he still wants to uh, be considered relevant with his uh, successors in the Defense Department uh, or, or the Central Intelligence Agency. But it obviously has no credibility. And you're right, even though they were talking over each other, unlike you and I, and, and I'm not critical of John, that's his style, and he is my friend. And I spent a lot of time with him on, on his show, The Daily Show. Uh, uh, but But for the general to say... We, we're spinning tops or spinning plates like a guy in the circus, and that's really uh, our goal, uh, is absurd, meaningless, and indicative of just send the troops in and let them stay there. Do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely. Because remember, large numbers of people in Washington, in the defense industries, in the political structures, they're all making lots of money. They're benefiting enormously from the large yes that flows from these military commitments. You know, Britain took an estimated 40 trillion in wealth out of the British Empire, especially, especially India. Most of that wealth came from India. India was the jewel in the crown. Now, by the time you get to World War II, India is no longer producing that kind of wealth. And so, in fact, some people would argue it wasn't producing that kind of wealth by World War I. But when did the British finally leave India? when their debt to GDP ratio was 240% in, in 1946. They Correct, were right broke. after the war, right. They were broke. And we ran them into bankruptcy, by the way. <clears throat> now we are running ourselves into bankruptcy. And what you are seeing unfolding, I think, has a very high probability of becoming far, far worse than anything we saw in 2008. Now, I could be wrong. There are lots of people who said, oh, no, that's impossible. We will master this crisis. And of course, at the end of the discussion, the answer is always the same. We'll buy more treasuries right. and we'll print more money. Right. Uh, well, <clears throat> God bless and good luck with that. I think those days are over. And I think we're going to watch this entire house of cards collapse. Now, when that happens, no one in Washington or anywhere else is going to give a damn what is happening in Ukraine or Southeast Asia or South Asia. Well, as you point out, there are two crimes the first one is the one that you're referring to, the release of the documents for which there is no excuse, stiff penalties under the law, 
if this is the individual who did it, he'll end up going to prison for some period of time. The second crime, of course, involves that committed by our government and its senior leadership against the American people. And for that matter, you could argue against most of the people that are in the countries that belong to NATO, because this has exposed the lying on a scale that we haven't seen really since the Pentagon Papers. In fact, you could make an argument in some ways this is worse. Now, you and I know that if people have watched you or watched others, not just me, but others, you, you know who they are, Larry Johnson, Brother Ritter, and so forth, none of this is news. What's in those documents are the kinds of things that we've been saying for many months. We've all yes. been called Putin agents. We've been crucified in the press, ridiculed all over the place as traitors and God knows what else. All we've done is tell the truth. That's a very serious crime. And I don't know when you say how much damage. Well, first of all, most of this information, is, as far as I can tell, is secret and then so-called no foreign. Need to understand that if you want the kind of information that are in these documents uh, that are classified secret, you can find it out through open source. You, you don't need satellites and extensive collection systems to get to it. That said, some of this information, I, I have the impression, is TS, or close to top secret, in which case collection devices, the means of acquiring information, human and otherwise, could be at risk, in which case it's serious damage. But I think the serious damage is outweighed by the good, to be blunt, because it's finally reaching the broad public. They need to know that virtually from the beginning, people in this government at every level have lied to them. The American people need to stop it. Only they can do it. I mean, it, it goes without saying that my hat is off to you, Colonel. I agree with you 100%. As I understand the documents, we'll put aside what they say about Egypt and Israel and North Korea. But what they say about Ukraine is the government knows it's a losing battle that Ukraine can't win. That's, that's the takeaway that I get. The government recognizes a kill ratio of seven to one. The Russians are killing seven Ukrainian troops for every one Russian that the Ukrainians kill. The Ukrainian air defenses are so degraded they'll be down to zero or useless uh, by late May uh, or early June. And... The Secretary of Defense knew all this when he made the following statements to Senator Roger Wicker uh, of the Senate Armed Services Committee. I, I would like you to tell me if it's any possible way that what he said can be reconciled with what we now know he knew at the time he said it. Take a listen. With regard to your optimism about Ukraine having the upper hand, that is what you told me yesterday. It, it is. Now, uh, Ukrainians have inflicted significant casualties on the Russians, and they have depleted their, uh, their inventory of uh, armored vehicles in a way that no one would have ever imagined. And so now we see Russia reaching for T-54s and T-55 tanks because of the level of damage that the Ukrainians have inflicted on them. And we have, in the meantime, been... And reaching, reaching for those tanks uh, demonstrates what to you, sir? It demonstrates that uh, their capability is waning. And we've uh, continued uh, to witness uh, them be challenged with artillery munitions and other things. And they're reaching out to Iran. They're reaching out to, uh, to North Korea. I think, you know, we'll see an increase in the fighting in the spring as uh, conditions for maneuver improve. Do you believe there's a real chance for significant Ukrainian advancements between now and the beginning of winter? I believe there's a chance and we're doing everything that we can do to uh, ensure that they have their best opportunity to be successful, Senator. Now, the documents hadn't been uh, revealed to the public at the time he said that, but the documents are dated February and early March. It's almost inconceivable he didn't know what was in them at the time he was making what, in my view, I'm happy to hear yours, a representation that is 180 degrees from the documents. Yes, uh, it's, it's unambiguous, Judge. The Secretary of Defense lied. He's not the Lone Ranger. He's got plenty of people working with him and around him who have lied publicly. So is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I, I suspect that if you go trace it through uh, European command, the Supreme Commander of Europe is probably also signed on for the same lies. 
we have to understand that this is part of the problem that has evolved or developed for many decades. The senior leadership thinks it has a duty to lie because the political leadership has said it's vital that you do so. No one stands up and says, by the way, it doesn't matter what the Ukrainians do. They have no chance of winning a war with Russia. <laughs> Everyone with a lick of common sense knew that back in January of last year, for God's sakes. And then on top of that, you have this relentless nonsense coming out that the Russians are incompetent. The Russians are stupid. The Russians are corrupt. The Russians can't do anything. The Russians don't want to fight. The Russians are war criminals. 99% crap. What have we heard about the Ukrainians? They're all supermen. Everyone's a Medal of Honor winner. They're inflicting huge casualties. The opposite was always the truth. Here's what we've heard about the Ukrainians. Here's what we've heard about the Ukrainians this morning. And you're certainly not going to hear it from the Pentagon or the CIA, from our friend Cy Hirsch, that the Ukrainian uh, military, diplomatic, and political leadership has skimmed $400 million dollars from the cash that Joe Biden has sent over there. And when the director of the CIA, uh, Director Burns, went over there to talk to President Zelensky, he named by name, he had a list of 35 generals who uh, did the skimming, and President Zelensky's name was on the list as well. President Zelensky proceeded to fire 10 of the generals and do nothing uh, to the others, because this type of skimming is well known and well understood. This is taxpayer dollars, or to be precise money borrowed in the taxpayer's name. The Congress has authorized the president to send over there, which he sent as wire transfers to Ukrainian banks and as cash in those huge cargo planes that the Air Force has. Yes, and, and we have covered this many times, talking about the corruption, the disappearance of equipment, and hundreds of millions of dollars in cash into all sorts of places. And by the way, inside the Ukrainian army, this reaches all the way down to the level of lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. You've got people at every level who are pocketing cash, and the soldiers know it. If you go on Telegram and catch the videos posted by Ukrainian soldiers before they're removed, you can hear them talk about it. Ukrainian soldiers know this. Why are we hearing Ukrainian soldiers say the first thing we've got to do is go back and hang Zelensky and his crew. We want to get there before the Russians do. That, that's been coming through off and on for months. They know that they've been betrayed. How uh, uh, reasonable is it to suspect that a 25-year-old enlisted uh, Air National Guardsman uh, could possibly have had access to documents of this level of security could possibly have shared them with a group of uh, teenagers. This could possibly have gone on for months uh, before the government uh, caught it. Or stated differently, could this 21-year-old possibly have acted on his own? Well, let's be frank. Uh, this makes the Pentagon look like a, a substantial component of the larger clown show that constitutes the government in Washington these days. I don't have an immediate answer, except that I can tell you that I have worked with 25-year-olds and 24-year-olds and 23-year-olds in, in the Army who were very reliable, who would never have done such a thing, who understood the gravity of the situation. So I, can't, I cannot say, you know, as a matter of generalization, that you shouldn't allow anyone of the age of 25 or 26 or anything else to handle this. That's just unfair. Right. I don't know the background on this man. And I, you know, again, you have officers that are appointed the task of evaluating individuals. I mean, they put them through a, an investigation. They ask hard questions and they determine whether or not someone is reliable. So you've got to go back and find out who gave this man the access. Here's uh, an interview that the Washington Post did with one of the young men in, in his gamer group. Um, and, and, you tell me if this young man is credible or if the government uh, put this out. Young man is unnamed. He refers to the guy they arrested named Jack Teixeira. We just saw a picture of him in his Air Force uniform. It looks like he's taking a selfie of himself there or looking at his iPhone uh, in a locker room of some sort. Uh, but take a listen to what the Washington Post says is their interview of the young man. Is this credible or is this what the government wants us to believe? Watch. 
I would not call OG a whistleblower in the slightest. I don't think that there was a goal nor some sort of accomplishment that he was looking for in sharing these documents. Of course, there's some anti-government sentiment, but that's not unlike most right-wingers in the modern day and age. OG was not hostile to the U.S. government. However, he had disagreed with several occasions such as Waco and Ruby Ridge and thought that the government is overreaching in several aspects. There was no heavy Snowden-like conspiracy here like some people may believe. People were reading them and they were not commenting on them. They were just sitting there. He is not a Russian operative. He is not a Ukrainian operative. I'll go as far to say he's not even on the east side of the world. Any claims that he is a Russian operative or pro-Russian is categorically false. He is not interested in helping any foreign agencies with their attack on the U.S. or other countries. He was a, he was a young, charismatic man who loved nature, God, who loved shooting guns and, and racing cars. It would appear as if he sort of grew angry with the fact that only one or two people were paying attention to these documents that he was pouring his heart out into. And as a sign of just anger, he just decided to post the full documents. He was a very smart man. There's no way in any world that he would not know that he knew that these were illegal. With all your experience in the military, is this credible? It, it admittedly sounds very suspicious. There are several red flags. <clears throat> First of all, the man is unusually articulate. This is not a stupid man. And uh, he comes across as having almost been rehearsed. The, the things that he says, he ticks them off one after the other, what this man is not, and then does something that's particularly suspicious, characterizes him as a, another right winger who, who didn't like something or was complaining about something. You know, this may come as a shock to most of your viewers, but almost no one who volunteers to fight in the United States Armed Forces for the United States of America is a left winger. So, I mean, that's an absurd statement. Uh, but that, that raises the question in my mind whether or not this man is not rehearsed and is sending that message uh, for a specific purpose. It shouldn't make any difference, frankly, Judge. The crime is committed. I don't think there'll be much question as, as to that, whether or not he thought it was going to be entertaining for his gaming buddies is irrelevant and he's intelligent enough at the age of 25 even if he is only in the national guard which is as you know is a very temporary volunteer citizen soldier setting he's smart enough to know that this is wrong so uh, uh, our, makes me suspicious our friend larry johnson who i'm not going to ask jack divine about this at least not today <laughs> god only knows you never know the man may know I mean, you. yesterday <laughs> jack had the kill ratio in reverse and claimed that the Ukrainians were killing seven Russians to every uh, one Ukrainian the Russians were killing. And I couldn't disabuse him of that. I mean, just read the documents. But anyway, uh, when I asked Larry Johnson, who spent his career uh, in the CIA and, and other government intelligence uh, agencies, uh, he's of the view that this is a government setup, that the government knows that Joe Biden and, and Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and Lloyd Austin have no off-ramp for the disaster in Ukraine, and they're preparing the American public for this crash landing. And this fellow, Jack Teixeira, uh, Gary just put his uh, picture up, this 21-year-old whom the FBI arrested five minutes before you and I came on air, this guy is just a scapegoat. I guess that would mean that somebody from the government let him have it, gave it to him. So my question to you is, I have to ask about his age. And you and I know a lot of smart young people. I lectured, as you may know, for a couple of years at West Point. Some of the smartest, your alma mater, some of the smartest, most courageous, most trustworthy human beings I've ever met in my life. And they were all 21-year-olds. But does a 21-year-old Air National Guardsman get a top secret, no foreign security clearance? Rarely. Rarely. There has to be uh, an unquestioned critical need or utility uh, involved in this. For him to have access to a SCIF, Specialized Compartmented Information Center, and then to read the material, to download the material, one would think under normal circumstances, no, but there are certain circumstances that might permit it. As I said before, I've worked with people just as you have that are under the age of 30, under the age of 25. And I put my life in their hands. I know I did because I did it on the battlefield. And I would trust them implicitly. I, 
I don't know enough to know whether or not the government is as smart as you're suggesting. The second part of this is how many Americans are really paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine? And sadly, I don't think enough. We'll get back to Ukraine in just a minute. I want to play a clip of General Ryder. He's the Air Force General who's the current spokesperson for the Department of Defense. The key to what we're going to play is the question. He doesn't answer it. I would argue by not answering it directly, he is declining to refute the presumption in the question, which is, how long has this stuff been out there? Take These documents were available long before April 5th and 6th. So what took so long for <laughs> DOD and the intelligence communities to, to locate these documents? Yeah, so that's really something that the investigation will tell us. Ah, he can't answer that. Mark Milley read the documents. Lloyd Austin read the documents. Lloyd Austin then went and lied under oath and misled the United States uh, Congress uh, and the American public. Joe Biden, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, by their words and behavior, continue to mislead the American public uh, into a fruitless, useless, uh, destructive, counterproductive war, which they don't even call uh, a war. I'm talking about the American involvement. American boys are shooting at, at Russian boys remotely. The American CIA is stealing uh, Russian secrets and giving them to Ukraine. They're not telling us this. No, and, and no one should be surprised. We haven't had a real declaration of war for a very long time in this country. And in most cases, the American people and the American people's feelings or sentiments have been largely ignored. Uh, and they've learned a very hard lesson from Vietnam. If you can minimize your casualties or keep them at very low levels, chances are no one will notice and pay any right. attention to what you do. Uh, my feeling is as follows. Uh, Blinken and company or civilians... And whether or not they believe what they say is, is open to debate. But the people at the top of the Defense Department know the truth. Any man of honor uh, in, under these circumstances would resign. I certainly would not feel comfortable as Secretary of Defense if I knew that I had willingly lied, not just under oath on, on the Hill, uh, to the American people. I mean, Marshall once was asked, do you think you ever lied while you were chief of staff throughout the entire war? And he paused and he said, I need to think about it. Then he came back and he said, I think I did on one occasion and I wasn't aware of it until I'd done it. Mm. I think that's probably a truthful statement by Marshall. Marshall was very careful about this. And if he could not answer a question because it had implications for our security, and he went through this with Truman when Truman was a senator. Truman wanted to know about the Manhattan Project. And he simply said, Senator, please don't ask me about that. I cannot tell you. It's not because I do not trust you. That has nothing to do with it. This is far more important, and I cannot discuss it. And finally, Truman let him go because he said, I know Marshall is honest. Right. We, and, then, of course, Truman, and then, of course, Truman became president on a moment's notice, knew nothing about the Manhattan Project and had to be educated, and of course, used it. This is the development of the atomic bombs by the U.S. Um, getting back to uh, Ukraine, I want to play a piece for you uh, by President Zelensky. It, it, it's in whatever language he speaks. What do they speak? Is Ukrainian a special, a different language from Russian? Oh, yes, of course. And he's supposed to speak it. So let's listen. <laughs> okay. And then you'll hear the translation, which I believe is a computer translation. So it's a little stilted. We'll play it for you twice. Tell me if you think Victoria Newland wrote this statement for him. The world should know respect and order will return to international relations only when the Ukrainian flag returns to Crimea, when there is freedom there, just like everywhere else in Ukraine. The world should know respect and order will return to international relations only when the Ukrainian flag returns to Crimea, when there is freedom there, just like everywhere else in Ukraine. And what are the chances of the Ukrainian flag returning to Crimea, Colonel? Uh, about as much as uh, the return of the $400 million that we're missing. Uh, and plus the fact this business of when freedom, justice, and the American way return, give me a break. Ukraine is horribly oppressive right now. If anything approximates a single-party fascist state, it's Ukraine. 
So where do we go from here? The government is embarrassed. The government is humiliated. The government is fighting a war that the government itself believes can't be won. Joe Biden has no off ramp. This 21 year old kid has been arrested for something somebody much higher up must have given to him in the past uh, through his hands. Will we ever know the truth? Well, remember that from the very beginning, uh, even though it was never stated categorically, there was never much interest in Ukraine per se. Ukraine was simply an instrument with which to attack Russia. And the goal was, quote unquote, to harm Russia, destroy Russia, change Russia's regime, its government, uh, depose uh, Mr. Putin. In other words, if you look carefully, from your standpoint and mine, this is a humanitarian disaster. This is a crime against the Ukrainian people, not just against us and the people that live in the NATO countries. But I don't think that's important to them. These are ideologues, whether it's Blinken or Newland or Sullivan or any of the people that are on the NSC staff. Their goal has been accomplished in their minds to some extent. Well, we've harmed Russia. Now, the truth is they haven't. Russia is stronger than it's ever been. Its economy hasn't suffered. It's now built back to where it was 30 years ago. Only its, its forces better, better equipped, better manned, better commanded, better led. So it's backfired. It's been a disaster. We've probably destroyed NATO. With each passing day, look at France. Look at the, look at the troubles on, on the streets in France. If anybody thinks that's exclusively about pensions, they're daft. The truth is that Europeans are unhappy with all of this. Colonel, do you have an opinion about how much longer the hostilities in Ukraine will will go on? The Russians, when they changed horses back in the summer of last year and prepared to build up the force for a decisive operation to win control of Ukraine, whether that came as a result of negotiation or on the battlefield, planned then on a 30-month campaign, roughly. So that's how long they, they are prepared and, and positioned to fight. I don't think it'll last that long. I think that uh, once the ground dries, the Russians will sweep forward. It'll be deliberate, but they'll go forward and take all of eastern Ukraine. Will they go then over the river and head south to seize Odessa at the same time, or will they wait? I don't know. But once they've controlled the east, they'll, they'll be prepared to cross the river and go west, because from their standpoint, Unless the Europeans break away from us, which is not impossible now, and say, this is enough. We Germans, we French, you know, who, we all of us together in Europe have had enough of this. This war needs to end. We want talks. And if they will sit down and talk to the Russians and hammer out an agreement.